All right, so we're here with Dr. Kelly Bulkley today, who is a dream researcher, psychologist of religion, and author of numerous <clears throat> books on dreaming. So he earned his doctorate in religion and psychological studies from the University of Chicago Divinity School, and he's a past president of the International Association for the Study of Dreams, a senior editor of the journal Dreaming, and he directs the Sleep and Dream Database, which is an online archive and search engine for studying dreams. So thank you for joining us, Kelly. Oh, happy to be with you. Thanks, Kelly. Yeah. Um, just to get started, I wonder if you can tell us, uh, how did you first get interested in dreaming and what made you choose religious studies as an approach to studying dreaming? Yeah, yeah. Well, I wasn't particularly interested in dreams as a, as a child. I was very much a kind of outer world focused kid. I, I liked sports. I, I was pretty good at school. I uh, had friends. I was kind of focused outwardly. And that continued into uh, sort of adolescence until a series of recurrent nightmares sort of forced their way into my attention, uh, into my, my awareness. And slowly but, 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 but surely introduced me to the idea that I had an unconscious self, that there were other parts of me besides my kind of waking ego and everything that I did in the waking world. Um, and, you know, long story short, uh, that, that discovery itself seemed to create changes and, and responses within my dreaming that gave me the sense that, that, that our dreaming selves are not just uh, raw material, but rather have uh, an intelligence and intentionalities uh, of its own. Uh, so that, that got me interested and, 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 and uh, it didn't hurt that it was a, a, a successful form of adolescent rebellion, kind of, mm -hmm. kind of rejecting everything that, 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 that I've been taught and trained for. Uh, a complete repudiation of that to go into the study of dreams was not what uh, my parents, my family, my, my upbringing had uh, uh, you know, steered me towards quite the contrary. So it was, uh, it was effective uh, in that way. Uh, uh, but also not just because of that, but also felt meaningful, gave me a sense like, wow, this really is something with whatever strength and energy I've got is worth my, my devoting my life to. So that has been, I, I kind of had that feeling, you know, late teens, early twenties and, uh, yeah, and then then so went to you know freshman year of college. I went to a psychology class and uh, really didn't like it. Really felt like wow, that is not what I want to study, or at least in yeah. that way as it was being presented yeah. there. And and what I found was uh, the academic study of religion, not not studying to be a minister or theology per se, but the academic study of religion actually for me was a, a kind of an ideal. Um, arena in which to study dreaming uh, historically uh, from multiple perspectives and exploring these 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 strange depths that I had felt I had experienced myself. So, yeah, that's that's fantastic. Uh, when I started to study dreams, I, I was not that interested in them when I was a kid either, mm -hmm. but it was in undergraduate, and and I started to work on them after I got my degree in mm -hmm. behavioral neuroscience, but I was surrounded by people who said, you're absolutely insane. Why, why are you right. getting interested in dreams? You know, mm -hmm. don't do that. <laughs> right. Don't, don't go there. That's, that's going to be bad for you. And, it, and it, but, <laughs> but, but I had, um, well, and this is one of the things I love about you, Kelly, and also Michelle is, and I think I can say this about myself as well. The three of us have a passion for dreams. Yeah. That there, we, we have an, an intuition that the culture, the wider culture needs dreams. Science in particular yeah. needs, needs dreams. Yeah, yeah. And, and, but the culture um, badly needs dreams to find a more sane, more humane, more capacious, you know, just... Yeah. Yeah, and they're there just just if we just turn and pay attention. Michelle, what, what, what's what's your origin story like? Was that were you uh, was your family thrilled that you were interested in these things, or was that? 
Well, I kind of, I, a slightly different approach, but I was already interested in psychology and neuroscience and studying it as an undergrad, but I didn't, I didn't really have that passion for it until I started to have uh, lucid dreams myself. Yeah. And that's what made me want to understand the psychology and the neuroscience of dreaming. And it gave kind of meaning to what I was studying at before kind of a superficial level. So it gave kind right, of an right. experiential meaning and I could explore my mind and explore my experience through dreaming. So it, it gave me definitely a passion for something yeah. that before was just, you know, science. I was good at it. I was curious about it, but, but dreaming really gave meaning to that, that study. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Were you, were, were you actively discouraged, Michelle, from pursuing dream studies? Or I don't think anyone thought <laughs> it was actually a possibility <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that yeah. I would really yeah. do uh, dream studies <laughs> as a yeah. career, but I managed. So. so I don't think anyone discouraged just because it seemed so impossible. <laughs> yeah, so, well, that, that, I mean, my sense... Just, just broadening and, and, and these, you know, here we've got three, three cases of, of, you know, the meandering path that leads uh, to the study of dreams. But that, that in itself, I think, reflects where we are culturally, that, that there is not a, that, that you really have to, like, have a purpose. And, like, you have to really want it and feel it and, and be driven yeah. because our culture doesn't make it easy, right? Doesn't, doesn't. Yeah automatically value dreaming or the study of dreaming it'll get there and, and we're, i think we're helping the cause but um it's just interesting and, and anybody who listens to this I, I i would imagine probably has their own individual unique path that they're having to follow so. yeah you would think that one place where there would be a real um passion for dreams is the psychology of religion you know which yeah. you've really worked hard on kelly yeah. And, um, well, I've always, you know, I've wanted to, I've racked my brains why the cognitive science of religion or the neuroscience of religion or even the psychology of religion has neglected dreams. You, I mean, you've been a standout yeah. exception to that rule. But, but I completely, as you know, I completely yeah. agree with you that a key origin of religion can be found in dreams. So if you really want a scientific account of religion, you got to look at dreams. But, right. but the psychology of religion, with some exceptions, and certainly the cognitive science of religion, right. has not done that. Why? Yeah, well, uh, I've got a nice answer and then a more <laughs> critical answer. I mean, the nice answer is um, dreams are hard to study. Uh, there, yeah. you know, methodologically, there are a lot of challenges to, sure. uh, you know, all the things I'm sure, you know, you, you're actively familiar with and, with, and, and, and how to, how to manage that. And so, um, it, it, it takes, it takes time to kind of develop the, the basic scientific tools and resources and, and literature Indeed. Yeah. to enable that. So, you know, probably every field feels like it's, not moving as quickly as it could. It needs more resources, more this and that. So at, at some level, that's part of it. The more critical response, Patrick, is that, that, that dreams obligate a researcher to self-reflect. There's almost no way to really explore dreaming without opening up one's own dream life, one's own mm -hmm. being to the dreaming experience, uh, as, as, as much as you might try to keep it at kind of a third person uh, detached remove. And so I, I, I just think people, and, and maybe this says something about the sociology of scholarship, that, that people who are academics, highly trained, professional scholars, uh, maybe they're by, the, by virtue of the way they live their lives, less connected to their dreams than other people. I don't know. It, it, it raises the question to me of, can you study dreams without having your dreams study you? you know? And is that, just, is that just too uncomfortable for a lot of people? It's just like easier to say, mm, yes, you know, Kelly's doing that, Patrick's doing that, you know, a couple other people are writing about this, but um, I think it just, it just opens up more than a lot of people want to get into and which is too bad. And so the challenge then for those of us who do feel this is, this is an important um, 
uh, a, an important way of thinking about human religion and psychology and, and, and all these things is just to kind of keep building up our basic science. Yeah. And, you know, there's something to the passage of time and more skeptical voices recede. You know, part of it, Patrick, I'd say, is also uh, maybe some legacy uh, holdover of, of hostility from psychoanalysis and Freud. Sure, sure. Like anything yeah. having to do with dreams <clears throat> brings you into Freud land and who wants to go yeah. there. I mean, yeah. I don't have a problem with that, but... Um, Me either. So, yeah, yeah right. so it's a tough question. I, I, I you know, yeah. it'd be fun if there were more people involved, for sure. So, yeah. better. I think one of the, when we look back on the psychology of religion, I think one of the landmark texts will be your book on big dreams and the origins of religion. Could you, um, if, if, if the audience was cognitive science of religion people and psychologists of religion, yeah. what would you say to them? You know, coming out of yeah. your, coming out of that book, <laughs> the, you guys need to start studying dreams and here's yeah. why or what yeah. what what's your theory of um dreams and and religion uh wow okay <laughs> well i think that dreams are um sort of as you as you suggested at the outset i think um in in virtually every religious tradition around the world dreams have played a role um if not at the very origins of the tradition around the origins around its spread around its transmission sacred texts, um, ritual practices, pretty much every aspect of well, almost every religion, you can find elements of dreaming uh, either subtly woven in or sometimes very, very prominent. So the, the, the history and the cross-cultural um, uh, pervasiveness of these dream practices and experiences and beliefs, that in itself, I think to a cognitive scientist of religion, is interesting. Any any religious any phenomenon you see all around the world yeah. mm -hmm. that, that that is connected to religiosity, right there. That's a that's a juicy topic for the. You would think so. Religion. Yes, you would think so. <laughs> because yeah. it's it's because what that's saying is that it's 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 transcultural. There's some yep. there's some quality about dreaming and its relation to religion that's independent from whether it's an Australian Aborigine or a medieval yep. Christian or a contemporary atheist even. We see similar dynamics in all of those. And that, right, I think that's, that's, that's an invitation to a cognitive scientist of religion to say, okay, what are yep. the evolved features of the human brain-mind system shared by all these people in all these places that is generating, uh, uh, generating this phenomenon? You know, and, 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 and I think, too, the, the pervasiveness of dreaming is uh, a real advantage for, for this kind of approach because you don't have to only look at, at meditators, people who are very specialized. Mm -hmm. Everybody dreams. Yeah. Everybody dreams. You don't have yeah. to go hunting and, and searching. Yeah. And um, so, so, yeah, I, I, it, it feels like an under utilized resource. And going back, um, you know, to the beginning of the field in some ways, William James and the, the Varieties of Religious Experience, which many people credit as the kind of the founding of the psychology of the religion, yep. 1901, 1902, somewhere in there, uh, that text mentions dreams once in a, in a footnote. Um, long, long text, 20 plus lectures, and he never mentions dreams. So, yes, you know, suspicious minds might wonder, is there some denial going on there? Is there some resistance? He was uh, so great in so many other ways, but he underestimated dreams. But yeah. what is it about dreams that is so fertile for religion? Or how, why dreams yeah. as, a, as an origin, as a key origin? Yeah. It seems to me yeah. they're key. They're maybe even yeah. causal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, one way to, 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 to put some language around kind of that, that, that deeper ultimate quality is that the dreaming, um, well, my, my general idea about dreaming is that it's a form of imaginative play in sleep. Mm -hmm. The dreaming is not just metaphorically, but literally 
play. It is the mind playing in in its uh, a sleep appropriate mode. Why and, why use sorry Kelly? Why yeah. use the why use the phrase play rather than the one that's more often used these days, simulations. Dreams are simulations. Yeah. Why um, play? I mean because what, what more I, does play give us? Okay, well play gives us access to um a pre-human pre uh homo sapiens evolutionary lineage of behavior and adaptation that we see and there's a huge literature on play in yes. other animal species right yep yep and and so dreaming again those of us who who are familiar you guys are you know masters of this how sleep and dreaming emerge out of the brain mind system mm -hmm. to me conceiving of dreaming as a kind of play gives us much deeper, deeper um, evolu roots in evolutionary biology and in the history of, 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 you know, the mammalian line and not just mammals. I mean, many, you know, birds as well. Your, Patrick, your, your book on uh, sleep in different animal species is, yeah. you know, is, is, is amazing, a, a fascinating resource. So, um, you know, simulation, I, first off, that's, that's, metaphorically that's that's drawing from contemporary computer language i always get mm -hmm. a little iffy about yeah. why are we conceiving of the mind like a computer that seems tail wagging the dog yeah, um so you know i and and i guess as, <clears throat> as i understand simulation is, is it's used in different theories that's a subset of what i'm speaking of in terms of play that's a that's a, mm -hmm. a mode of playing is to mm -hmm. simulate things in a particular way. It's not the only way that dreams, you know, dreams do all sorts of things. And, so, and, and play, it seems much more broad. It's both rooted in the evolutionary literature and the comparative animal literature, but it's, so there are threat simulations in dreams, yes, but if you take the, the lens of play, then it opens up a much wider perspective, it seems to me, about what dreams are doing, you know. That's, that's, that's the hope. Now, you, you asked, you know, why are dreams so um, generative of religious and spiritual yeah. thought and experience? And so within that context of dreaming fundamentally is a kind of play in, in entering into kind of the human realm and, and our species and our particular constitution and our, you know, shockingly big brains, when we go to sleep and when our brains play, we've got a lot to work with and the associational network expands exponentially mm -hmm. and we begin to go beyond what and this is my the phrase i'd use in a, in human dreaming we go beyond what is to imagine what might be we we, we yeah. go beyond the given of our sensory experiences and imagine alternative possibilities realities scenarios Absolutely. we simulate things yeah. uh, <laughs> and that 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 i would say is sort of one kind of opening of the religious imagination where we begin to imagine well, what happens after death mm -hmm. um what happened before the world was created what's going to happen will the world end what are those things up in the sky those little mm -hmm. points of light um why do you know bad things happen all the all the great questions of Religion, I, I think, Patrick, this is kind of what you're getting at, in some ways can be brought back to aspects of pan-species dream experience. Mm -hmm. And if we anchor the dreaming experience in these deeper evolutionary threads of play and mammalian adaptation, uh, that starts to look, I don't know, that starts to cohere, I think. That starts to look mm -hmm. kind of conciliant in E.O. Wilson's sense of things. But don't we... Um do counterfactual simulations and imaginative scenarios when we're awake as well. What, mm -hmm. a, what, what is it about mm. dreaming per se that, right. you know, like in your book, you really get into um, these uh, different um, types of dreams that seem to be particularly yeah. important for the religious consciousness. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it seems so. So what I try to do, you know, hopefully as, as, as helping the scientific cause, trying to build up from 
description, from observation, from empirical data. Try not to, sure, sure. you know, theory first and then find yeah, the data good. to fit in. But like, okay, what, yeah. what are the data? And so looking, casting through the history of the world and, and anthropological studies of dreams, what actually do people most often dream about that has a religious or spiritual quality for them? Mm -hmm. And in, 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 in the Big Dreams book, I talk about four of these and, and kind of how they seem to map onto physiological uh, aspects of, of, of sleep and dreaming as well. So mm -hmm. getting a sense like people aren't just making this up, that they actually, we yeah. do have reason to believe that there are psychophysiological roots to, to these reported experiences of extraordinary types of dreams. And Briefly, I think of them as um, aggressive types of dreams, mm -hmm. uh, chasing, being attacked, things that are very arousing, stimulating. You know, maybe it's a demon, maybe it's a monster, something that, mm -hmm. that, that, that's alarming. Sexual uh, uh, dreams sometimes can have, have a, a, a transcendent quality, a kind of a, a more real than real quality that, that um, and if we're talking about sort of evolutionary biology and, and, and our instinctual drives, that's certainly, that's actually, I would say the sexual dimension that dreaming is, is under theorized in contemporary kind of science or religion and in dream theory, to be honest. I yeah. think that it, because again, it's like, oh, Freud and <laughs> yeah, what yeah. talking about. All right. But if we're talking about evolutionary dynamics, it's got to be key. On, yeah. You know, come on. Yeah. So, um, and then uh, gravitational dreams, dreams of people uh, falling and chaos, which in their most mythological form take, the, the, uh, take on qualities of apocalyptic uh, end of the world themes, that, you know, everything falling apart. And then uh, what I call mystical dreams, dreams that, that, sure. that go fully beyond the uh, uh, sort of the everyday uh, you know, Newtonian physics of this world and people fly, uh, people who are dead come back to life, otherworldly visions appear. Um, so those are, those are sort of the classically mm -hmm. religious types of dreams. But the other kinds as well, aggressive dreams, sexual dreams, gravitational dreams, are also reported frequently in cross-cultural literature. Um, and are frequently generative of spiritual thinking. Like, God, what did that mean? What did that, yeah. that means? That means something about reality, about life, about me, about you. Um, big dreams uh, yeah. that, that, that have a, a, a kind of an echoing effect through uh, religious and spiritual beliefs. And in many cases, generate new religious and spiritual beliefs, give new ways of thinking about God or heaven or the afterlife or morality and so on. Yeah. So if, uh, if, um, if um, I see, like, and, and this did happen to me, my, and for both of my parents, when they died, they died about a year apart, but I, I s experienced them visiting me in my dreams mm -hmm. and it was utterly real. It didn't yeah. feel like a dream. I could smell them. You right, know, I could, right, I could right, really right. sense their presence and I can well imagine you know, a, a ten thousand years ago, even hundred years ago, I would say, this is this is absolute evidence of an afterlife. Yeah, 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 I, yeah. Visitation dreams, um, and probably Michelle, to what you were mentioning earlier, lucid dreams. <clears throat> oh yeah. Also, widely cross-cultural. Um, you almost can't wake up from dreams like that and not think differently of the waking world. Um, so. This is where, you know, again, it, it methodologically, it requires a lot to uh, create a, 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 I don't know, a way to persuade skeptical, skeptical mm -hmm. people that there's something here because dreams are complex. They're, they're, it's hard to verify subjective reports, so on and so forth. Right, right. Um, but, but again, I think that the, the, the ability now and I think contemporary technologies and 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 you know advances in various uh, fields, cognitive science of religion as a as an emergence I think is 
offers a lot of great resources. It's too bad that not, sure. not many others are yeah. uh, trying to, uh, you know, bring dreaming into that conversation other than, yeah. than you know, maybe present company. But yeah. um, it's, I mean, that's, a, that's offering wonderful resources to help us understand these things even better than, than ever. So that's, that, that is exciting. I totally agree that the dream community can learn from the cognitive science religion people and vice versa. Yeah. But, uh, but we know you, you, your work is so much more than um, about religion. You do so, much, so many other things mm -hmm. around dreams. And I know uh, Michelle has some questions for some of yeah. those. Yeah. Well, I think, but, yeah, I think a good transition <laughs> though is in talking about uh, dreams how they can be spiritual experiences. They allow us to feel and think in ways that we don't access in normally in waking life. But a key then is, well, then how do we share these experiences with other people? What are the dream sharing practices that you've mm. seen in religions? And then we can move from that into, you know, now how do we, we can share through art, through film, things like that. Mm. So I guess start with the, what do you see in dream sharing practices in your religious yeah, studies? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's actually a, a kind of a, a, a rising interest. Um, and, and, and I'm getting the sense that looking at dream sharing practices in different, different cultures, in contemporary um, settings, uh, that, and, and particularly, as, I think, as you, as you mentioned, uh, I've been doing some work with, with artists and different people uh, who work in creative realms, that there's something uh, about how dreaming almost completes itself in a sharing context that the dream, you know, there's, there's the Talmudic saying, you know, a, an uninterpreted dream is, is like a, you know, an unopened message or something. And, you know, just a, only to remember a dream, but not to share it with anybody is almost like, mm, that it, mm. it's not, it hasn't done its, its full, its full thing yet. There's something more, that it's calling for. And not every dream maybe feels that way, but some dreams uh, kind of spontaneously generate a, a, a feeling like, I got to tell somebody this. I'm going to tell my, you know, somebody in my family, I'm going to tell a friend, um, you got to hear this dream. Mm -hmm. And, and again, that's, I, I, I'm, I'm proposing that that is not just a trivial throwaway phenomenon, but that's actually a, a, a pervasive human behavior. That, that spontaneous dream sharing is part of the human experience. And many cultures over time have created uh, traditions and practices and ways to enhance that, to kind of channel that. And so uh, Native American cultures, uh, particularly the Great Lakes region, the Ojibwe, the Algonquin, people in that, in that neck of the woods were, you know, among the sort of the most sophisticated in generating cultural um, uh, practices that could enable people when they had dreams and wanted to share them. There were, there were spiritual groups, there were, there were sort of uh, group leaders to, to focus on, you know, war and peace and trade. There were, you know, family groups. There, there were quite different places you could go, mm -hmm. depending on what, what was going on in the dream. So uh, all the way of saying that that, I think, is closer to the norm of, of, of human uh, experience over the, the, the millennia. Uh, hy hypothetical, but nevertheless, I think current evidence, even in the attenuated form we see it, people in modern times spontaneously share their dreams. And I, 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 I could pull up statistics, but the, you know, there's a lot of people who never talk about their dreams, but a, a non-trivial number of people mm. who do on a regular basis mm. uh, without any particular encouragement. So mm -hmm. um, I guess what, it, what, it, what it, it leads to is the idea that what is, well, what's happening when you share a dream? What happens when you hear someone else's dream? And, and here's where I think we've gone in Western society a little bit astray where we've We've taken that communication model and, and, and limited it to a, a therapeutic context where the only allowable place to share a dream with someone is 
if you're lying on a couch yeah. with an analyst, right? And that's sort of the, the archetype, and that's not necessarily the way it always happens now. But so I think it's 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 given people a sense of hesitation, like, mm, should I talk about my dreams or where where is it safe to? Mm-hmm. What what are, what am I revealing? And it also has created this sense, like, when I hear a dream, when a friend or a family member or somebody tells me a dream. I gotta be Freud. Uh oh, yeah. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta stroke my beard and get my exactly. my cigar and offer an interpretation, right? Yeah. So, so we've 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 gotten we've we don't as a culture have great traditions and practices to mm-hmm. help us at either end of that dialogical right. uh, relationship. And so, uh, this is where artists, I think, and this mm-hmm. is just my own hypothesis and 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 you know, kind of running experiment, I suppose. Uh, is 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 exploring dream sharing with artists and seeing how with them it's a very quick and clear through line from either sharing their own dreams or hearing someone else's dreams to creative practice Mm -hmm. that that they have they already know how to deal with kind of inspiring moments experiences ideas, insights, and dreams are like, like a smorgasbord of all of that, right? I mean, just come, come in and, and, and enjoy, right? And, and so helping artists learn about just some simple dream sharing practices, I've, I've found, and this is ongoing work, but does seem to have a, a really profoundly stimulating effect very quickly in many different media, many different artistic uh, uh, formats. Uh, and just gets me interested about the how to how to expand on that. Maybe maybe the challenge in this society isn't isn't to share dreams, you know, to find out what's wrong with your relationship with your parents or you know why you're depressed, but maybe to tap into your creativity, to tap mm-hmm. to to explore an artistic realm mm-hmm. uh, of of experience and perception. So that's 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 where that's leading right. to. Yeah. Yeah, so there's this sense that we want to open kind of the channels of sharing and listening and exploring dreams in Western society. Because I feel that too. People share their dreams with me all the time. And I feel that they're like expecting me to suddenly say, oh, right. you know what that means? So, so, and, so, what do you, so what do you, what do you do when someone like, like asks you to sort of give you a magic eight ball answer to, you, to a dream? I, I usually just ask them a lot of questions because I find, yeah. uh, that they, they'll tell me just the dream, but then I'll ask questions and they'll realize there's so much more to the dream than what they originally told me. And they're, they're not used to someone actually being interested in asking them to explore their imagination. So I just, I ask lots of questions and I never, right. I never, I can never usually tell them what it means, but <laughs> yeah. I'll just ask questions. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Patrick, how about you? What, what about you? Same thing. I, 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 um, I do get a lot of people telling me their dreams and, I sometimes share one of mine in response, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. so I sort of actively mm-hmm. say, I'm not going to in- interpret because I, you know, I don't know how. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. But I, you know, I obviously, I think dreams carry a ton of meaning and that's the, and that's the, that's the old Freudian way to get at meaning is free associate to, you know, like, right. Like, yeah. Talk well, more about right. it. So, so at that level, and this is kind of, I was just curious because, because, one way I, I think of dream sharing is as another level of play mm-hmm. that, that it's that, that, that when you're sharing a dream, you're playing, you know, like there's nothing serious necessarily about that. That's just like, Hey, let me tell you something interesting. And, and, and what is the dynamic that gets going? And, and, and I think both of you, what I hear is, and you know, the, if someone says, here's my dream, what does it mean? And if you say it means this, there's no play to yeah. that, right? It's, it's, that's okay. that's not playing. That's at the all. end of it, yeah. right? That's like that, right? But but both of you, like like as you describe it, like hey, you have an interaction, you share a dream, you ask some questions, you're you're playing, you're opening it up, yeah. you're, you're letting it kind of have. I mean, I I refer a lot to um, the work of a psychoanalyst D. W. Winnicott and and his idea mm-hmm. of transitional space and 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 transitional uh, objects. And, and kind of what he describes as, as a third space between inner and outer life mm-hmm. and play being what happens in that, that, that third space. And so dreams, I feel like almost by their very nature, create that dynamic. 
Like mm -hmm. if you really, if you, if you can avoid the, if you can get someone to share a dream and if you can avoid the, when you hear it, avoid the temptation to say, I know exactly what that dream means. If you can just kind of let it be a space of play just emerges by itself almost. I mean, that's, that's mm -hmm. where, you know, maybe you've had the experience. It's almost like you almost don't have to do anything yourself. You know, you just let the dream come forth and ask some questions to let it come forth more. And uh, the dreamer, the dreamer is doing his or her own thing. You don't even have to like get in the way, right? At that mm -hmm. point. So. Hey, do you, do you too agree with um, this old young saying that uh, the, the, the dream is a living thing? Mm. It's, it's like it's alive. And when, and when you share it, 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 um, it feels like it's alive and an or organic thing that changes and grows and morphs and then influences and then has a life of its own. It just, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's some, we think of dreams as just mere representations of the mind, you know, yeah. and modern science, but it's, I don't know if I would go as far as Jung, but I think Jung is on to something there. And and your yeah. conception of it as play is uh, beautifully expresses mm -hmm. that, it seems to me. Michelle, what do you think of that? Yeah, I uh, so I did a research study last year where I did dream work with participants. And mm -hmm. first they would tell me their dream, and then I would have them go back in. And, and this is common in dream work, to reimagine things, to interact right. with things, to, to try being someone else in the dream. And in the first session, sometimes they would say, is this still the dream though? Or is this, am I just making this up? I said, it's, right, right, right. this is all dreaming. You just play right. with the imagination, you know, it's so. Yeah. I, I yeah. think it's, it's all part of dreaming, just imaginative. I think imaginative play is a great, a great way to, to put it. Yeah. 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 Why well, I, I, what I push back on is the idea that I guess Patrick to answer this question that the dream that when we interpret dreams, it's just like, um, seeing faces in clouds, right? That we're kind of projecting mm -hmm. meaning sure. and hey, that can be interesting because whatever you project onto a random stimulus mm -hmm. tells you something about yourself, but there's nothing really there, right? They are just clouds. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's true with dreams. Dreams are not atmospheric phenomena, you know, mm -hmm. meteorological things happening above you. They are literally the same they are you that's the same brain that, that that that's creating your waking sense of self is also at least mediating the creation of your dreams and so uh yeah so so you know i i i i do think of i think this is part of the mystery of dreaming is that it's yeah. both intimately me and yet it seems radically not me and so but there uh, kind of continually wondering about that question. Is it this, is it an alien intelligence? Is it other, is it something outside of me? Or is it, is it somehow a part of me that I don't, I haven't integrated, I haven't, I haven't encompassed, haven't made part of my, my, my wholeness. Uh, at some, at some point that becomes a kind of a metaphysical question. It, 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 mm -hmm. In, in practice, in sort of human experience, in our life, our lifespan, our, our three score and, and 10, you know, we get, um, we have this encounter with, with a non-ego source of awareness and intelligence and seemingly purpose. So uh, whatever we, we, we conceive that, I, you know, on this point, Patrick, I would not only refer to Jung. I mean, when I, when I really, go after this. I uh, refer more to uh, hermeneutic philosophy and people like Hans George Gadamer and Paul Ricoeur who, sure. who challenge um, yeah. enlightenment ideas about kind yeah. of the sovereign ego and everything else is kind of just kind of out there. And Gadamer and Ricoeur talk about how not just just talk about dreams, but kind of everything. We're always in a dialogical relationship. We're always anticipating mm -hmm. aspects of reality and then we're checking what reality brings back to us and it's a back and forth which i think maps you guys can tell me more if i'm right or wrong about this but philosophically i think that maps almost perfectly onto neuroscientific research about the constructive nature of reality and experience right sure. that that just yeah. seems like philosophically and jung says it in some way but just 
to to appreciate the 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 dialogical quality of our experience and how we think of the world and not as subject and control outer world there for me to <laughs> inspect right yeah and being a person in the world i have to also at the same exact time that i am myself in the world i also have to think of everything that is not me and how that is right. impacting me and that's what we're right. doing in a dream as well as we're we're we are the dreamer in the world, but we're also at the same time creating the right. entire world that's acting upon us. Right, 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 right. But, but, I, but I think you two have put your finger on uh, this, this central metaphysical question about mm -hmm. dreams, like to what extent are we creating it? And to what extent is it something that just happens to us? Mm -hmm. You know, that it, it, because I don't feel like I create it. And, and like you were, yeah saying um, before in one of our previous conversations, Michelle, lucid dream characters sometimes feel like they're totally independent of our will, you know? <laughs> and uh, so how can we even answer that question? I mean, the, the, the bias seems to be that, well, it's all our creation. So everything that's in our dreams reflect aspects of us. That's sort of like the traditional uh, clinical or psychoanalytic yeah. take on things. But, but I, I think, keeping that metaphysical question alive, Kelly, like you just beautifully mm -hmm. put it, like uh, the dialogical nature, the inherent dialogical nature of it um, keeps the essence of what dreams are, uh, are to me at least alive. I, I don't know what's mine and what's not mine in, in, right, in, in right. the dreams. Right. And I'd like to be alive to that and, 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 and stay alive to that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, that's 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 very well put, and 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 it does. I mean, it it, it I, we'd have to look, I guess, at various personality types or what that 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 inclines a person to feel more comfortable with that or less comfortable with that. And I guess there's a pretty uh, stable set of findings that that dream recall, higher dream recall, correlates with op more openness to experience. Right, big five personality. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, maybe that's, that's, that's a part of it. Um, if I could pick up because on something you just said, Patrick, because it, it maybe gets into something else you want to talk about, but the, the, the tendency of, of contemporary psychology or modern psychology, let's say the last hundred or so years to interpret um, our dreams and the contents of our dreams in subjective terms as aspects of myself mm -hmm. rather than angels or demons or, you know, supernatural beings, that has felt like um, progress, right? That has been right. generally conceived as, ah, oh, we're now kind of uh, recognizing what dreams are really about. We're not following these sort of superstitious ideas. We understand that it comes from the brain. Uh, and and, and that's, that's what it is in, in relation to the religious question. A, 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 a casualty of that move of the subjective move by modern psychology is not just a religious perspective on dreaming, but also a perspective on dreaming as an in source of insight into cultural and social dynamics. Mm -hmm. So when, you know, and Freud did this too, like, oh, well, if you have a dream of Count Thun, who is a, a, a he, he reported a dream that he had that's in the interpretation of dreams, a dream that he had of this, this reactionary politician, anti-Semitic politician that he had actually seen the you know recent times uh, at a train station and when Freud tells the dream that he had of this reactionary politician he interprets it almost entirely in a psychological vein as reflecting his hmm. problems with his father and you know personal thing and so the model is in western psychology to to personalize to subjectivize dream content and only to conceive it and interpret it in that personal intrapsychic register. Mm -hmm. And what we lose is the possibility that maybe a dream like that is about that politician. It's about <laughs> your feelings about that guy and what a you know jerk he's being in your perspective. Uh, mm -hmm. that was that was in Freud's case. So right. so this is something again that 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 you know other researchers, anthropologists are trying to bring uh, Western dream research back into mm -hmm. 
uh, an awareness of how dreams have this, this other dimension too. You don't have to go to the religious dimension if you don't want mm -hmm. to, but you really should pay attention to how dreams reflect social and cultural realities as well as personal. And, so and even, right? even political realities. I know even mm -hmm. political development. Yeah. Within that, yeah. within that realm. Yeah. I know Michelle has wanted to talk to you about uh, that aspect of your work as well. You know, yeah. well, that, yeah, and, that's, yeah. That's going into um, some of your work now, which is collecting huge numbers of dreams from people through your sleep and dream database and kind of using that to see how individual dreams and collective dreams are tapping into social and, and cultural issues. They're kind of like a, they can be like a cultural heartbeat in a way. Yeah, um, ooh, good, good, good <laughs> phrase, good phrase, yeah. So I wonder if you want to talk a bit about the Sleep and Dream database first, and then we can get back to this idea of how you're using it to, mm. to see what, what cultural issues are arising through dreams. Yeah, yeah, well, the um, Sleep and Dream database uh, is a digital archive that, that uh, with lots and lots of help, I've, I've been uh, working on since 2009 is when I dated, 2008, 2009. Uh, after 10 or so years of working closely uh, with Bill Domhoff and Adam Schneider with their uh, Dream Bank uh, database and uh, the, the resources there that, uh, uh, I mean, this is, all of this is like a complete 180 uh, turn in my kind of research career. I, I was not trained in database technology. Indeed, I spent a couple chapters in my dissertation beating up on content analysis and Calvin Hall and uh, quantitative efforts to kind of atomize dreams and chop them into little bits that felt like, you know, mean to the dream. Why are you doing that to the dream? Don't, don't turn them into zeros and ones. That's, that's no, no. The, the, the wholeness, the, 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 the gestalt of the dream is what we're, we're trying to enter in, you know, all that. And, and, Long story short, what I what I found after some time, and 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 with a lot of collaborative help from Bill Domhoff, who who was willing to patiently an, answer my questions about these things, I I came to realize that that the tool these tools themselves are neutral, uh, and it's just you, you they can be used for less interesting purposes, or in my perspective, more interesting purposes. And mm -hmm. so, uh, so learning how the Dream Bank worked creating my own database has all been a process of trying to find ways that, that, that digital tools can help do the kind of dream research I like to do and, and maybe others do as well, but that, that's not quite, you know, Bill, Bill Domhoff is, you know, he's a pretty, you know, straight arrow uh, 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 cognitive psychologist, uh, social mm -hmm. psychologist. And, uh, his questions, Calvin Hall's questions are not necessarily mine. So uh, all a way of saying that, that this, uh, the database that I've been developing is trying to be complementary to what, what Bill and Adam have done with, with the Dream Bank, but um, expanded in ways that enable research on questions like uh, cultural and social dynamics that, that, that aren't quite as easy to study in the, in the Dream Bank setting. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, there's there's a lot out there, uh, both in terms of um, people's dreams about uh, collective phenomena, the pandemic, Black Lives Matter protests, upcoming elections. Um, there's there's a lot of a lot of waking world uh, fodder for for worrisome dreaming, uh, and then also, and this is something the Dream Bank doesn't have, but I I, I, I put into the, the Sleep and Dream database is um, some survey data uh, that in, uh, involves an asking large numbers of people questions about dream recall, dream sharing. Um, have you ever had a dream of flying, of visitation dream, dreams of politics, uh, different kinds of questions and giving the ability to do some statistical comparisons on, uh, for instance, uh, attitudes towards dreams among whites, blacks, and Hispanics. Mm -hmm. um, you know, things that, 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 that are interesting and potentially uh, uh, can lead to other kinds of research if we, you know, mm -hmm. thought that that, that that could lead somewhere. Because this is all new and no one else is really doing this kind of research, I, 
I'm hesitant to, you know, get too excited about it because it's just me and, and this data, but I am hoping that it, 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 it encourages others to try exploring these same areas with these tools. I mean, it's all out there. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I do think that, that we're on the brink of, you know, really new and exciting era of dream research as these tools become more available uh, to a wider range of researchers and as researchers become more comfortable with them. Uh, you know, it's not just me, it's not just us. It's, it, you know, this could really uh, be, a, be an exciting new time. I mean, I think most scientific fields, when they really have kind of breakout moments, comes when new technologies suddenly get in the hands of lots of investigators. You know, yeah. so that's, that's the hope. Yeah. Yeah, that's really excellent work. I hope to do some work with the, the, the database myself. Um, so what, how can having like this large data set of dreams kind of, how, how can you use that to reveal patterns that are happening at a cultural or, a, you know, at, yeah. A, yeah, at a cultural level? Yeah. Um, Maybe take an example of like pandemic or the protests. Yeah, sure, 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 sure. Um, we well, gotta be careful. <laughs> you gotta be cautious because this is all, you know, a lot of people don't accept that dreams have any meaning at all, right? So you have to kind of get there and then you have to say, okay, you know, believe it or not, it's not just personal meaning, it's also maybe cultural, collective meaning. So the steps to make uh, a confident connection between patterns and dreaming and something collectively, uh, you know, we got to be careful of. Uh, that being said, you know, one of the, one of the uh, enduring findings over uh, the, the years that I've been studying uh, dreams in relation to politics, and I, I started this in the 1992 uh, U.S. presidential election. That was the first time I did a small but, 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 but interesting study on uh, do, dream, do, do dreams reflect what's happening at that level of our lives. You know, Calvin Hall, Freud, others said no. Um, huh, let's put it to the test. And what do you know? People do dream about presidential elections and not just in metaphorical or symbolic ways. So um, over time, as I've done surveys and, and interviews and different kinds of, of, of studies, the finding has emerged that people with, um, on the political left, tend to have um, higher dream recall, uh, more varied dreaming, uh, more, more dreams of flying, sexual dreams, you know, more varied palette of dreaming, should we say, and um, worse sleep compared to people on the political right who tend, you know, these are broad tendencies, of course, but who tend to have less dream recall, uh, a narrower range of types of dreams and better sleep patterns. So, huh, what do you make of that? Um, uh, and does that hold up, you know, I've got new data coming in this round, will that hold up in light of uh, what's going on now? Categories of political left and political right are not, the, are not stable themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, those are obviously, you know, very dynamic and fluid. Uh, so, uh, you know, a lot of moving pieces, but uh, something else that emerged uh, in correlation with that uh, recent study I uh, did that showed that people who had, let me see if I'm going to get this right. Um, people who had, is it the attitudes or recall? I can't, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to get this right exactly. There's a correlation between attitudes towards global warming and dreaming as well. And I can't remember if it was dream recall or attitudes towards dreams, but it was on the higher end of whatever the dream measure was correlated very strongly with greater concern about global warming. Mm -hmm. And the lower dream measure correlated with less or no concern about global warming, which maybe is another way of uh, stating that political difference. Uh, but on a specific issue, you know, that's interesting. That's to, to me, that, huh, what do we make of that? That, you know, does that provide a lever? For example, if, if you do, if you're someone who cares about global warming and 
you know, you can't, you can't tell them enough about polar bears and, you know, rising tides and things like that. Hey, maybe you get them more interested in dreams. Huh. They get more interested in dreams. Maybe that has some sure. correlational effect, get some more attentive to other systemic things where there are interconnections and where our narrow associations in normal waking life look different when we mm-hmm. expand our perspective. That's, you know, that's, yeah. that's, that's, that's something I'm, I'm playing with, shall we say, uh, right. Uh, right now on that front. Yeah, the finding about the, the sleep is interesting that having more recall, but worse sleep is associated with the left, but uh, better sleep if you're more politically right. It yeah. kind of, to me, it's, it's interesting because there is all the, always this question of, of balance, of having a balance between uh, yeah. your investment in, in dreaming and imagination and also having kind of a grounding place where you're, um, right. you know, we need our, our focused mind, our narrow mind. And some people say we need dream amnesia. We can't just, you know, imagine right. if we remembered all of our dreams all night long, yeah. that would mean that yeah. dreaming would really be like, <laughs> yeah. take up so much of yeah. our, our mind. So it's an interesting uh, balance to have to, to hold, I think. Agreed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that is, I've, I've, I've talked with people who will, will, from a conservative point of view, who I think can find some comfort in those findings. Like, yeah, dreams are crazy. We need our sleep. You know, like, <laughs> no wonder liberals are so wound up about things. <laughs> Um, yeah. And you could say that, and then from the left, you could say, "Yeah, no wonder conservatives are such, you know, stick yeah. in the muds, you know, who just don't, don't, can't look beyond the sort of what's right in front of their nose and see bigger, bigger things happening." So, um, yeah, you could go either way with that, uh, <laughs> or maybe uh, just we need yeah. both. And and you yeah. know, part of it too, I sh- I, I I should say, uh, political uh, in this in the U.S. Political uh, perspectives vary a lot with with uh, gender and with age, mm-hmm. and so you know it all seems to kind of go together. Younger, you know, younger and more female people tend to be on the political left. Huh? What do you know? Younger, you know, people who tend to be female are more likely to be dream rec- high dream recallers. Anyway, we kind of know that right. from other research. Mm-hmm. So right. um, that's interesting too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I see that we're near the end of our time together. And I, I wanted to make sure to ask you this, Kelly. Sure. I want to ask um, all of our inter- interviewees is where, where do you see the science of dreams headed? You know, like mm. a, what are some hopeful signs? What are some challenges? What's right. your take on the field as a whole and where we're, where we're going? Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm very excited about the future of this field. I think that, that as I was saying earlier, some of these new tools of, um, uh, uh, digital uh, data analysis um, are very exciting. I think there are a lot of, um, you know, Michelle, I know you've been working directly on this, but I do too, Patrick, I'm sure. Uh, various technologies for um, observing, for monitoring brain activity during sleep, um, ways of, of, of channeling, influencing things. Uh, uh, I think that we're going to learn more and more and in in, in 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 hopefully you know pretty quick fashion the um untapped powers of our sleeping minds and and what dreaming can can help us do in terms of dealing with the various uh, challenges we're facing in the waking world individually and collectively i i would also say um that, that we dream researchers are going to face, are facing, and we may not even know it yet, but are increasingly going to face uh, a, a host of uh, ethical questions mm. about how these technologies are deployed, uh, who's getting access to them, who isn't, what's happening to the data, uh, uh, what are, when, when we develop um, interpretive algorithms around certain kinds of uh, dream content and certain kinds of people. Well, huh, I, I read science fiction. I don't know about you, but I can imagine all sorts of uh, nefarious ways that that could be put to ill use. So in, in other words, if, if we develop algorithms that we such that we could take an example of a person's dreams and <clears throat> say, okay, 
This content analysis suggests that you, sir, are a mm. child molester, or you know, you don't know what I'm, that kind mm. of thing, right? That kind of thing, or yeah. you, sir, are um, a liberal, and so you know, we're gonna we're, we're gonna, gonna yeah. either yeah. you know bombard you with pro ads or against, or you are uh, oh you sure know, yeah hiding. yeah any so yeah. that's a possibility. There's um, you know, technologies that are being developed to influence dreams. Hmm. Yeah. That's, that's, we got quite technologies that allow us to observe dreams from a third party, third, third person perspective. Mm -hmm. Huge, uh, I would say, ethical issues around that, about how is that being monitored, recorded, who's, who's interpreting what's being seen. Are you thinking of neuroimaging or virtual Neuro reality? Neuroimaging, okay. yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and as, you know, technologies which currently are kind of exotic and, and mm -hmm. only found in, you know, labs that kind of have the extra resources to do that, um, as those technologies become more uh, uh, accessible, as technologies tend to do, sure. yeah. uh, these these will become real questions and 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 my feeling is uh generally not to uh say you know no 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 and 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 you know shut things down and try to limit things so much as let's charge forward we researchers who who have hopefully some training some 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 ethical compass around this to make the initial discoveries mm -hmm put them out there, help people get a sense of what's possible so they can be ready to defend themselves against, you know, the jokers and the, you know, the, 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 the crooks that could put some of these technologies to really ill use. And, and I just don't think it's, it's, it's um, too early uh, to be thinking about that, about longer term mm -hmm. potentials for how some of these technologies could be used. Just looking at, at, at how technologies already are being used in ways that people are really not comfortable with. And yeah, so that's, you know, I think we want to be on, we want to learn the lessons that are being taught right now in the tech world and see as we develop this, our, our domain, you know, still pretty much from the ground up, can we build our code better? Maybe, um, IASD, the International Associated Study of Dreaming, should convene a panel and specifically look at the ethics of upcoming dream technologies and dream well, science. I second that motion. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sure. yeah now, is, now is the time, I think, for sure, yeah. as these things are being developed. But they, yeah, they hold a lot of uh, potential, you know, as you, you're talking about, we as a society, we, we're, we could use kind of a new way of of interacting with and sharing our dreams and technology is one way to do that. I mean, we, we love our apps and our games and stuff on technology. So if we can make dreaming part of that, it could really engage a lot of people. But yeah, now is the time as researchers yeah. um, to establish kind of ethical foundations for doing so. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, and again, this is where I feel like the idea of dreaming as a kind of play can be helpful because to bring dreams out, not as like, okay, now everybody, you know, eat your vegetables. This is what you're going to have to learn about your dark, repressed unconscious. <laughs> no, 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 no. This is your creative imagination. It's, it's yours, yours. This is like, we're not even like, that's the thing. It's like, it's not selling something. It shouldn't be sold. Maybe that's part of it too, is that, mm -hmm. that I think something that has so much intrinsic value inevitably in this society there is an urge to commodify it to turn it into something oh, yeah. that can then you know bottled water you know bottled dreams like here's your dream no 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 i my dreams are my dreams and i think what researchers ideally are, are trying to do and iasd as well and other groups um sort of empowering people with their own dreaming capacities and giving them more and more tools and resources to understand their own dream world, and then to, to, to share that with others as they feel comfortable and feel as mm -hmm. comfortable. So. Right on. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Kelly. This has yeah. been really, really <laughs> enjoyable. Yeah, I feel like we've yeah, only no, touched on everything we wanted to talk to you about. So I hope we can nice. 
add a part two. At yeah, some point. sure. Yeah, no, no. I think it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, project, you guys. Thank you for taking the time and you know effort into to making this happen. I think it's going to help the field overall. I can't imagine just just very much. So that's wonderful. Mm -hmm.